Joining us on Leading Indicator is Ali Kashani, CEO of Serve Robotics, a robot delivery company backed by Uber and NVIDIA. Ali, thanks so much for joining quite the topic of the day. Thanks for having me, Anne. So, Ali, let's talk a little bit to, directly to folks who don't have as much belief in the robotic um area as perhaps you might like. The track record for autonomous and EV-related companies across the board has been somewhat mixed. And certainly in the public markets, been met with some skepticism. How would you persuade investors that the robotic last mile delivery is at a turning point? I think there's nothing better to persuade anyone than if they go to LA and actually see it uh, in action. It's the most normal thing People, uh, in fact, the most surprising thing about it is how nobody even pays attention to it anymore. You can walk by, you will see robots just moving around, doing actual deliveries from hundreds of different restaurants to real customers day in and day out. Um, I think if you step back with any technology, there is always that usually about 10 year period from when the excitement really picks up to when a commercial technology starts to be introduced uh, at, at mass scale. And this is roughly the same timeline that has taken place with autonomous uh, delivery and autonomous vehicles in general, drones, all of them are roughly you know, on the same trajectory. And I think you are going to see the result of that. Uh, uh, to me, investors should be careful not to quit on something when just it's about to take off. You just said in LA, you've got uh, robots serving hundreds of restaurants, Ali. Let's get a little bit specific. How many restaurant partners to serve work with at the moment? Uh, you know, this is this changes. It's growing every day. But I think the last number that we have discussed publicly is about 350 restaurants. And those include who? What are the kinds of banners you're working with? Uh, most recent uh, new addition was Shake Shack, actually, which we uh, talked about a few weeks ago. But uh, this includes, um, you know, restaurants from mom and pop shops around the corner to uh, to brands like Shake Shack. We uh, we've done pilots with Pizza Hut and, and Walmart and others that are now in the pipeline for you know future um, deployments. So uh, there is, if basically the way we onboard is on Uber Eats platform with an email. So anyone who's using Uber Eats can actually start, any merchant can start using uh, our robots if they're in our operating area. And, and what about your partnership, Ali, with 7-Eleven? Talk to us a bit about that platform. That's right. Uh, so separate from Uber Eats, we also have a direct integration uh, with 7-Eleven. Just like Uber, they're also one of our investors. And uh, there are a few stores, uh, a few locations of 7-Eleven in our operating area in Los Angeles that we can be delivering for. Let's talk, Ali, about how this translates into the hard math, right? So you're seeing some traction, you're, you're growing the number of partners that you work with. When it comes to your revenue, let's talk about your most recent earnings, about $470,000 of revenue in, in Q2 of 2024. 16% of that was from delivery service. What was in the other 84% of your revenue channels? So we have three revenue lines. Uh, one of them is the delivery fees that we charge. Uh, but besides that, the same fleet, when it's out there, it can also do advertising. Uh, this imagine buses and 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 you know taxis. They usually have the opportunity uh, for advertising, and it's the same kind of out of home advertising that they they apply. In this case, it's actually very compelling because robots get a lot of attention. Um, and we found so much inbound demand that we couldn't say no to it anymore. And we, we started to uh, receive uh, orders to have the entire fleet taken over. We have about 100 robots right now uh, by various brands. So it's been a really nice and robust source of revenue that, that uh, increases our top line really nicely. And the third one I should mention is software services. Uh, we have a contract with Magna International. They're our manufacturer, but separately, they're also licensing our technology to build their own robots. And as part of that, we've also been uh, uh, receiving revenue as part of that uh, work. So Ali, just to be a little bit controversial, if I, if I go back to that revenue in Q2, which is about half a million dollars, 16% feels a little low as being the revenue from the core robotic delivery service itself. How do you see that proportion changing over the next year, two year, five years? 
I would look at uh, look at our revenue as two buckets. Basically, there is the fleet revenue, and that includes both ads and and delivery fees. We don't necessarily look at them separately. Every new robot that comes online has the opportunity to make money by performing deliveries as well as uh, out of home advertising, um, and that part is going to grow faster than uh, the other uh, portion, which is the licensing uh, type revenue. So for us, licensing is a long term plan, which is we build a really incredible platform that enables enables robots to navigate complex human environments, and other folks are going to come and use that platform, but it's going to take them some time to develop their product. So I don't expect that to be growing immediately. But the delivery uh, fleet, uh, the fleet revenue is going to expand as we deploy 2,000 robots on Uber Eats, which is uh, the, the contract we signed with Uber a while back and are now working on manufacturing the robots and expanding them. The first 250 of them are coming online by the end of Q1, the rest by the end of the year uh, in uh, cities across the country. And talk to us a little bit, Oli, about your cash flow profile while that growth is happening. Where are you in terms of cash burn at the moment? Um, so we have actually have to um, see what what the latest um, earnings had in them. So I, I won't quote a number so that I don't get it wrong. But we have raised about $80 million since the beginning of this year, since going public effectively. And uh, that gives us enough uh, capital to deploy all of the 2,000 robots uh, by the end of next year. And with the 2,000 robots, we actually have the opportunity to get to profitability. So that's, that's the way I would think about our, our cash situation. And so now let's think about the, the cash flow of your clients. I'm very curious. We've been in a hot labor market the last couple of years. We've seen a number of restaurants talk openly about the challenges of right, the rise in the cost of labor. H- how has that factored into the demand for your fleet of, of robotic vehicles? I mean, I think that's one of the key drivers. You have shortage of labor, you have the cost of labor, just general inflation that's that's putting a upward pressure on all costs. Um, so when you look at services like last mile delivery right now, um, they are really struggling with the cost. Uh, merchants are upset that they're paying too much. Uh, delivery platforms are struggling to turn a profit. Uh, of course, drivers believe they're not paying enough, uh, getting paid enough, and customers believe they're paying too much. Uh, so there's just something fundamentally broken here, which is the fact that 70, 80% of the cost in delivery is labor, and it's quite inefficient the way it's done today. If you look at the last couple of centuries, in the first mile, the, the long distance miles, we have three orders of magnitude or more in efficiency increase in labor productivity. But if you look at last mile in the last century, it's like a 2x improvement in productivity, even with computers and GPS and AI and, and everything that was created in the last century, car, even cars. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. And I think all the forces have come together. Compute is cheaper, AI is better, sensors are cheaper, uh, the robotic technology as a whole is working, while at the same time, cost of labor is higher than ever, and there's a shortage, and a lot of businesses are struggling with that. So on the one hand, let's, let's take a step back and put our regulatory hats on now. On the one hand, you can see there could be an argument that makes this um, perhaps appealing as, as you've got businesses trying to lobby to increase their profitability and, and stay in business. We saw a lot of uh, these um, restaurant businesses go out of play during COVID. Anything that helps them feels like it could be positively received. That said, what are city regulators saying to you, Ali, about this? Do they want a bunch of these vehicles flying around on sidewalks. What's their view on safety? What's their view on the aesthetic for the city? So it's a good question and something we were very mindful from the very beginning. Um, so we've been very engaged with uh, with cities as we roll out. Rather than ask for forgiveness after the rollout, we actually always talk to them ahead of time, make sure that uh, we're partnering with them. And our pitch is pretty clear. Every time you're replacing a car delivery, which is 90% of deliveries, by the way, uh, with a robot delivery, you're making cities safer, you're making cities cleaner, and you're making cities more efficient. You're reducing that cost to local merchants. So <clears throat> whether a city cares about the, you know, the environmental impact or the safety concerns, or it, it is to support their local businesses, this is a win-win-win scenario for everybody involved. And we found that the traction has been really positive. There is 20 plus states right now that have put positive regulations to encourage delivery robots. 
generally speaking, by default, there are no bans against robots anywhere in the country. They, they can operate anywhere unless a city goes ahead and puts a ban in place, which is very rare. And cities we've ever wanted to work with have always given us permission to do so. So we have a 100% banning record there. And how many cities are you actually in today, Ali? Right now, we are operating in uh, Los Angeles and the city of West Hollywood, which is uh, its own independent city as well. But we've done pilots in Vancouver, Bentonville, and other places as well. So where's next? Where do you think we're going to for sure see uh, adoption of serve robots in the same way that LA has adopted them? So with the new batch of robots that we are now manufacturing, uh, we are first going to expand our footprint in LA. We announced Koreatown, but there are more neighborhoods we are going to go to. And then by Q2 of next year, we plan to uh, add an additional market, our first uh, new market besides LA. We are thinking about Dallas and Vancouver, San Diego. There's a few places in the list, but we are narrowing it down and deciding which one to, to go with. Let's talk a bit about the, the core technology that you have uh, been innovating, Ali. Suds currently at level four autonomous technology. Talk about what that means versus full autonomy, what's level five. What's the bit that's missing that gets us all the way to full autonomy? So um, maybe for folks who, who uh, forgot their definitions for autonomy, I'll, I'll just quickly outline. So level two is your Tesla. You have to hold your uh, hands on the steering, eyes on the road at all time. Level three also requires hands on the steering and attention all the time because if there's any problem, the human is responsible. They have to jump in right away and, and take over. Level four is the first time where humans are not in the loop anymore, where robots can do things by themselves. But, and this is the caveat, when they need help, they would call home and someone can step in and help. So there is usually an operating uh, design domain or ODD where the robot can do things by itself. And when it steps out of that domain or when it actually has any other reasons to require help, humans can step in and help. So that's what we mean by level four. Level five is effectively where you don't need any human help. And I think if you talk to folks in the space that have spent years like myself uh, you know, working on this, they would tell you that this is mostly sci-fi. I don't believe any robots are going to be at least in public environments with level five. And it's not even necessary economically. Once you have 99% of things done by the robot, that 1% automating it might be more expensive than just simply relying on humans to help. Let's talk a little bit about another technology, Oli, that's been pushing the frontiers of delivery, and that's drones. Is that an area that you can see serve going into in the future? Um, we are not planning to go into the business of creating drones, but there are actually very natural partners for us. Um, what you have to kind of understand is delivery is generally multimodal. So every package, every, every uh, delivery has a vehicle that's most suitable for it. If you are trying to go short distance in, in uh, you know, somewhat populated environments, usually robots are the best way to do it. Uh, getting to a restaurant, for example, when drones or self-driving cars want to pick up an item from a random restaurant on the street, it's very challenging for them to actually get to the restaurant. They need dedicated space for loading. Uh, think about, you know, most restaurants usually don't have dedicated parking. They, they don't own the real estate nearby. There are people around. Robots, on the other hand, can get all the way to the front door of a restaurant comfortably. They don't have a noise problem. They don't have safety concerns. In all those cases, the robot is a better mean of getting to those populated environments. But if you want to go 10 miles out, like where I live, we don't even have sidewalks. We are like five miles from the closest uh, downtown area. This would be a really good place for a drone. We have enough real estate for a drone to land or drop off the package. And there is an opportunity for the two to also collaborate, where a robot could pick up an item and then hand it over to a drone for it to complete the delivery. So there could be deliveries we do all by, by a robot entirely, and deliveries where a robot does the pickup and hands off to a drone or vice versa. Interesting. You, let's talk a little bit to you, Ali, about the partnership with Shake Shack that Serve Robotics recently announced. 7-Eleven was your first convenience store partner. Who would be your next dream partner? If you could pick one and almost advertise for one right now, who, who would you want to be wanting to solicit conversations from? Well, you know, we, we have, as I mentioned, we have done a few pilots. So there are folks in various stages of the pipeline. The way we look at it is uh, Uber is a fantastic platform for us to get in front of a lot of restaurants very quickly. Uh, but there are relationships where 
doing a direct integration makes more sense. There are, there are some of the brands that actually have their own customers and they would like to access the fleet directly. So there, there are a number of conversations happening there that, again, we would have more to share in the, in the coming months and a couple of years. Uh, the good thing about this model is that as we expand to a new city, we can immediately tap into all the demands because, again, Uber gives us access to a ton of restaurants right away. And with the additional QSRs and brands that we work with, usually they would also have multiple locations operating in any neighborhood we go to. So we can basically, by, by you know, pressing a button, uh, unlock that demand. You've mentioned restaurants a lot, Ali. And again, we've got the, the pattern of, of partnering with convenience stores, 7-Eleven. What about with grocery stores? What about with any other kind of category that delivery could be applicable to? It doesn't just have to be restaurants. Yeah. I mean, look, Last Mile has a lot of applications. Uh, food is really uh, a good starting point because first we eat three times a day. Uh, also, we need the food right away, which means it's the most expensive Last Mile delivery in all the segments. Uh, if you can't wait for your package to be batched with a bunch of other packages in a truck, usually that means that you know a person has to bring it to you in a car, usually one or two items in the car. Therefore, it is the most expensive type of uh, delivery. So it makes a ton of sense. Lots of demand, lots of struggle with costs and uh, highest cost, therefore the most value for us to capture. But once you have a fleet of uh, last mile robots, there's really no end to the applications. You can use them for groceries, for alcohol, for pharmacy, for parcels, obviously. And I actually think the more exciting things is the stuff we can't even think about right now. Imagine, for example, ordering you know, shoes and having it show up today, you have to wait a couple of days, you get a size, you have to return it if you don't like it or if it's not the right size. But what happens when you have automation in last mile where you can actually get three different sizes in a robot, you pick the one that actually fits, put the other two back in the robot and it goes back. So we can actually solve reverse logistic problems and change shopping behavior in, in ways that are not possible. I think you're going to see a lot of new applications for what we're creating right now that we can't even think about today. That, that is a fascinating application to, to look out for. So thank, thank you for sharing that nugget with us. I'd be very excited to see that one really redefine uh, direct to consumer and home shopping, particularly in, in categories like apparel. I can't let you go, Ali, without touching on the relationship between Serve Robotics and NVIDIA. There's a financial stake. Tell us what that looks like. And, and also talk to us whether there's any other kind of relationship between the companies as it relates to AI or to chip usage. Yeah, so we use NVIDIA chips inside the robot. We have multiple NVIDIA chips inside. It's really what powers uh, the brain of the robot. It's what makes it possible for us uh, to use all the, the, the incredible AI that actually powers this, uh, these robots. Um, we started working with them back in 2018. Uh, as you may know, our history, we actually started inside Postmates, which was one of the largest delivery platforms in the country. And then we were acquired by Uber. And in 2021, we spun out and became an independent company. So NVIDIA invested in us after the spinoff. And they've been uh, they've, they've invested in multiple rounds. They own about 10% of the company today. But the relationship actually goes back all the way to 2018, where it started as a technical partnership. So we are an early user of some of the chips and technology technologies that NVIDIA built for the autonomy space. And it's been a close collaboration where we try to um, learn from them and, and, and give them feedback on, you know, what we are learning. So it's, it's been a really fruitful uh, partnership and we're very fortunate, obviously, to have them um, as a partner. Lots more to come. Ali Kashani, CEO of Serve Robotics. Thank you so much for joining us. That was it, folks. See you next time on Leading Indicator.